Hi everyone, it's Sariskin and welcome to the premiere episode of Leveling Up with my very good friend, Her Grace Damari. Thank you, Mari. You are welcome. I'm pleased to be here. I'm so glad you agreed to do this. Um, Mari is going to share with us today her magic sleeves, um, which I have seen once in person, but it was a very long time ago and I don't remember. And she's been gracious enough to do a video for us and also talk us through it. Um, so I'm super excited. Do you want me to start with your pictures or do you want to start with some sort of background? Sure, let me give a little bit of an introduction to these. Uh, so I refer to them as magic sleeves because they allow for a complete movement. And I'm going to talk about this in the video too, because I made a little video for us um, so that it can be stand on its own later. So it goes into a lot of detail, but as an introduction, the sleeves that I've modeled, um, I started doing these many, many years ago. So um, they're based on the Alsega sleeve that is a 16th century sleeve and it's a two piece sleeve. Um, and the sleeve caps are a lot flatter and I'll show you those pictures in a second. But what this does is it allows for a complete range of motion. So as a fighter, we know that we need to get both arms out there. Sometimes we're crossing our arms. We get into some weird positions because that's what fighting is about. But even for somebody who's not a fighter, putting up a pavilion, doing your hair, there's so many clothes that are not made for movement. And so what we do is we add that movement into uh, and allow the fabric to absorb that motion because we're not wearing stretch clothes, we're wearing fitted garments that have restrictions. I don't use this sleeve obviously on tea tunics and raglan type sleeves. This is for a fitted sleeve. So all of our tunics of course are not cut with that. And we tend to move inside the tunic or the tunic is bagging enough that it moves with us because there's a lot of extra material. But when you start looking at a fitted coat, like this is my fencing jacket. If you start looking at a fitted coat, then that sleeve can be restrictive. And so this is a way to make it fitted and to give it that look while also allowing you to have full range of motion. All right, let's look at slides. All right, let me share the screen and make sure that I'm not sharing sound because we've tested that and that is not a good thing. No, that was no bueno. All right, is, can you see the picture? I can't. You can't? Nope. What are you seeing? Black screen. And you, there it is. There it is, all right. Okay, so this is a typical modern sleeve. This is a one piece sleeve. That center line goes straight down from your shoulder to your wrist down the, out, down the uh, top of your arm and the, bottom, the two pieces that are out at the edges, those are actually under your arm and start from your armpit and go down to your wrist. So this is a modern sleeve and you can see that the sleeve cap or the bell of the sleeve, it looks like a bell curve and it goes way down in the, the underneath, comes up to the top of your shoulder and then goes all the way back down. By doing that, that actually gives you a nice smooth sleeve cap but it restricts your motion. So if you look at the period sources of sleeves, it gets much flatter. Next. So this is out of Janet Arnold and is one of the extant examples of a sleeve. So this is a two piece sleeve. It is cut in a curve, which allows you for the elbow bend, it gives you extra material at the peak of your elbow and takes away material on the inside of your elbow so that you don't have a bunch of material bunching on that inside of the elbow, giving that range of motion. And if you look at that sleeve cap, that curve is much flatter. Even if you look at that with cutting the bottom sleeve in half and putting it over on the other side, it's a much flatter sleeve cap and that gives you a much greater range of motion when you lift your arm. We have some other examples out of Janet Arnold and out of Alsega. So we'll flip through those real quick just so you can see some of the alternatives. Can I ask a quick question? Like some of, yeah. the, some of the patterns call for a sleeve that is not two parts. 
Um, would right. you recommend um, making a two-part sleeve? Is that, does it give you better range of motion? The only advantage to the two-part sleeve is that it takes away that extra material in your elbow. So if I'm fighting in that garment, I, I definitely use this later period sleeve, even in my 14th century garments. Um, although if you can do the same technique with a straight sleeve, it's just that you're making that top uh, flatter and then you're doing the fitting method that we'll show in the video. Uh, and that works with a one piece sleeve also. Uh, so okay. if I am, if it's a bulky material and I want to have less material in my elbow, I would do this two piece sleeve. Um, there's, if you flip through, you can see where there's one where the upper sleeve part is joined. Oh, you want me to keep flipping? Yeah, go ahead and, and advance to that one. This one or? Uh, next. There we go. There. So you can see that this one is a two part sleeve and that it's curved, but you could also take that exact same sleeve head and then just have that arm be straight. So that would be a one piece sleeve. Um, but by having it not curved, then you are relying on the material to be full enough around the elbow that you can bend uh, and, not, and not have that restrict you. So that same sleeve head will work. Now, in this example, the fold, if you will, is joined to the back of the arm, and then it's open, you're, you're adding your seam down the front of the arm. In the 14th, 13, 14th century stuff, we see that seam is still down the back of the arm. And that's why you can have those fancy buttons down the back of the arm and they wind up on the outside of your wrist. So this example would actually be flipped around if you were doing that seam just down the back. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Next. Next. So here's an example of a coat that it, it historically would have been worn with, uh, and it's just a, a simple doublet. Um, I say simple, but you know somebody went through a lot of work to pink all of that. But it's a you can see that there's not a puff in the sleeve. It is a flat-headed sleeve, uh, and you can see how it has a little bit of bunching under the arm, just in how it's it's sitting like that, and that's because that's your extra material. Okay. Okay. Next. Somebody asked if these slides would be available later, and um, we will make the slides available later, um, maybe as comments um, on the video. Excellent. And um, I will, there, this series of, we'll call them the green photos, is how to draft this basic sleep, because I realize that a lot of our viewers are very new to sewing or new to fitted sewing, so they're used to doing tea tunics and things, which is fantastic. But once they start getting into doing a fitted sleeve, they have no idea where to start even. And starting with a modern pattern is difficult because I'm asking you to alter almost everything about it. So in this, this is how I draft a basic sleeve. Now, most of my sewing is done on motion. So I like to have my person I'm sewing for stand with me to get sewn for. First of all, it gives me company and I don't feel like I'm sewing in a ditch, dark place. Instead, I get to sew with people. Um, but it also allows me to accommodate their motion specifically. However, sometimes you don't have that person with you and you need to make something that's going to work. So this is how I draft the basic sleeve that we're going to start with. So you're going to start by getting a few measurements. And the first one is the upper arm, the shoulder point to the elbow. And on mine, it's 13 inches. Yours may vary. I'm putting these measurements in. So if you suddenly get 27 inches, you might go, huh? Maybe that's not quite right. And I decided that even though um, Lacock is all metric, that my Lacockians are bright enough to be able to translate measurements. Thank you for that. Um, if you are drafting sleeves for yourself, um, do you recommend having a buddy? Like, because taking self measurements is very hard. Yes. Yes, I like to have a buddy to measure my, to do those measurements. I did these measurements by myself. Um, but 
in doing all of this, it is much easier to have a buddy because otherwise you're taking the garment off, you're pinning stuff, you're putting it on, figuring out where it doesn't work, taking it back off, repinning it. And it can be a very, very frustrating process. Whereas if you have a buddy, even a buddy that's not a sewer, they can adjust for those things. And, and once they understand the basics of pinning, you know, you pin with them and you show them what you want. It actually works out very well. Okay, cool. So yes, a buddy is good. All right. Next slide. Yep. So as you saw on that top sleeve, it says on grain line because you want that distance is consistent from your shoulder to your elbow is consistent because that's a bone. It doesn't move. Now the elbow moves and the shoulder moves, but that doesn't move. I do about 160 to 170 degree uh, at the elbow. Um, and this can vary. Some people don't have as much motion. Some people it sits differently and they're like, oh, okay, I'm having a lot of bulk in the, uh, in the inside elbow. And so in that case, you make it straighter or you have somebody that, that wants it more bent and it's a comfort thing. This is a good place to start. So if you have big biceps, would that be something that you would want more bend for or? Um, not necessarily. You're going to do your bicep measurement, which we'll get to in a minute, um, is going to be a big influencer on that. And when you do your fitting, sometimes you'll find that you're adding more to the top sleeve than to the bottom sleeve. Because as you saw, there's two pieces to this. Um, and that bicep measurement makes a difference. And sometimes it's difficult because your bicep actually is bigger than the arm's eye. So you wind up um, having to arc it back in or making the arm's eye bigger so that it accommodates for the extra bulk in the bicep. Can I ask one more question? Um, are you drawing your pattern on just like a piece of throwaway fabric? Is that what this is? Yes, yes. So this is just a throwaway piece of fabric. It's going to become my mock-up. Uh, I try very hard and I don't always succeed in making a mock-up, doing the fitting, making the adjustments, and then redrawing out the pattern. Um, sometimes I'm just like, nah, this is good. And then I draw it all on one thing. And then later on, when I go to work it, I can't remember what changes I made. So I do not recommend just moving forward I, I recommend once you've made changes, redraw it all out so you have a piece that you know is right. Okay, and then of course you're going to do the elbow to the wrist. And I generally will bend the arm and do from the point of the elbow to the wrist. And I always add a little bit there um, to the point that I add and I add and I add and suddenly my sleeves are four inches too long. So, you know, you, you don't need to get quite that crazy. Just make it, I usually will make it just a little bit longer than I think I want it because I can always cut these shorter later. And if your sleeve calls for like going to the knuckles, would you um, replace the wrist to the knuckle? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the arm's eye and uh, we're gonna show you a picture of what, what we mean by the arm's eye, just in case you don't know but you're gonna measure the arm's eye on the seam allowance. Now, because this is half of the sleeve, you're gonna divide by two because we're, we're going to draw basically what is the upper half of the sleeve twice because in the fittings, we're gonna accommodate the bottom half of the sleeve, but we're gonna cut two of these exactly the same. So we're gonna take our measurement of our arm's eye and that's, it's my arm's eye was 20 centimeters or 20 inches and then I divided by two to get 10 inches. So. In our next picture, we'll show you the arm's eye. So somebody asked that they don't know how to find the point of their shoulder. Okay, so at the bones here, um, you can feel where your collarbone comes together and there is actually a bone right there that you can um, see and that's the point of your shoulder. Okay, all right. As opposed to the deltoid, which is down in here, so you're up into here at this point of the shoulder. All right. Okay, so the black line is the arm side. So this is the draft of the my coat hardy. And my coat hardy actually has two front pieces and two back pieces. So, you know, I am not that skinny. That's half of my each part. Um, so <laughs> you, just so you know, <laughs> disclaimer. Um, so, I'm so going to take about seam allowance, but you're going to talk about that later, right? 
Right. I use five eighths or 15 mil or 1.5 centimeters. Those are all the same number, more or less. I'm translating. Um, but I use five eighths. You can use half, especially on a sleeve because it gives you less bulk. But I find that with five eighths, it gives me a little bit of extra to play with. Um, and if I'm dealing with material that's going to unravel before I can finish that seam, it gives me a little bit more leeway. Once you start reducing that to half an inch or a quarter of an inch, then if it starts to unravel, you wind up with it falling apart fairly rapidly. Okay. Okay. So on the next slide, you can see I use lovely patterning material. So on the next slide, I actually talk about the, what you're looking at. So um, the black line is what you're measuring, but you're not measuring the seam allowances. So you're not measuring the seam allowance at the shoulder and you're not measuring the seam allowance that's at that side. And you can see that it has a stop point where that side seam allowance is and where the shoulder seam allowance is. So we're gonna add seam allowance to our pattern. We don't wanna accidentally add it in two or three times. And are you so, going to take the measure of the arm side from your bodice or is that is there some measurement on your body that you use? You want to use it from your actual pattern. So when you start, I always do all the drapery and the fittings of my uh, body first. And so I have a doublet pattern that fits me and I adjusted the arm's eye already before I start this process. So I know where that arm's eye is going to sit because the arm's eye, there's a practical place for it. We'll talk about that in the video. And there's also a functional place for that. And uh, with fashion, sometimes the fashion has that arm's eye sloping off your shoulder. Sometimes the fashion, like we won't talk about grand assiettes, but if you have that really deep arm's eye, obviously that's going to be much bigger. So that arm's eye on your garment will show in your making your sleeve. The two things work together. We'll talk about this in the video too. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go over what the video says too much, but at the same point, if you hear it again, it's not a bad thing. Um, your arm's eye and your sleeve head work together like your helmet and your gorget work together. You know, we only require that you have your head and your neck are covered. And if you have a gorget with a bever that comes up to here, your helmet doesn't have to come down as far. Whereas if you have a little bitty gorget, your helmet has to compensate. Same thing on a sleeve head. So with the arm's eye, if the arm's eye is very small and, and comes out a lot further on your arm, then your sleeve head's gonna be smaller. But if I take this arm's eye in deep on my body, my sleeve head has to be bigger. So the two of those things work together. And if I alter one, I have to alter the other to get it to fit. All right, so there's your bicep uh, measurement. And you know, if you if you want to add a little extra on that, you know, if you if you want more motion or if your material is stiffer, you can make that a little bit bigger. Or if it if it make, winds up being a lot bigger than your arm's eye, then you know you can extend the arm's eye out a little bit and you may need to actually, you know, futz with that some. And this is the, and on the bicep measurement, you know, I'm, I'm measuring my bicep and then I'm taking a look at how far down from my top of my sleeve, that, that shoulder point to my bicep. So that's how far down that line went. And then the elbow circumference, I'm actually closing my elbow and I'm measuring around here because I need to know with the arm closed, how big this is. So my elbows are actually not nearly as big as my bicep, but once I've closed my arm, then this is tight. So I measure this mo measurement in order to get that elbow circumference. So our hands have to go through. Now my hands, um, are they collapse very well. So my thumb actually collapses under my hand uh, very tightly. And some people don't, some people will, will sit out here more, but if my hand is going to go through a sleeve, I need to make sure that whatever this maximum distance is will go through the sleeve, or I need to open the sleeve up and add buttons or some other closure. If I want the, the forearm to be close, you know, maybe doing a closure is the best idea, but
But if I don't have something that's going to open here, then my hand needs to get through. If you're making this as a fighting garment, it needs to not only get through normally, it needs to get through when I'm hot and sweaty and frustrated. Because if I need to get this gambeson off right now, I don't want to be trying to fight that distance. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I think we all have, which is why we can give this disclaimer. And because my hands collapse, um, it allows me to get my hand through a pretty narrow opening, which means that other people can't borrow my clothes. Especially boy people. Boy people's hands are much larger than mine. For some reason it's not letting me go to the next slide, so let me. Ooh, circumvent that. Is that where we are? Yep. So if it's the wrist circumference, then you put that in. If it's the hand circumference, you put that in. If you're having a sleeve that you may use for a different purpose later on, it's better to go with the bigger measurement because you can always cut your pattern down later. So now this measurement is, if I take my arm all the way forward and I measure from where my pattern is hitting me on this arm's eye back here, and then all the way forward to the elbow. So if my arm is relaxed in here, this isn't stretched out and it's less, but this is where it's going to make a difference in how we are able to move. Because if this is restricted, I'm not gonna get this arm all the way forward. So this is a very important measurement to go from that arm's eye all the way back here where it hits, um, where the, the pattern touches me here, and measure all the way forward here to the elbow. So that gave me an extra inch and a half. And so I added that in. And then I'm just gonna true that out from that top down to that front point to give myself that new distance. But remember that if that's added extra to your arm's eye that you might have to adjust for that again in fitting. Okay, so you're gonna connect all those points. I use 15 millimeters or five eighths of an inch uh, for my seam allowance. And you add that all the way around. It's good to be fairly precise with that if you are fairly precise in your sewing because every step that you vary off of that, if I make it 15 mil and some spots are almost, you know, 20 mil and other spots are 10 mil, then when I sew that, I'm going to make it vary too much. So try to be precise in doing this. Okay, so when I say adjust for fashion, that's where I say, okay, if you wanted to have wider sleeves or if you wanted to have this be a short sleeve thing or if you wanted to have it be, um, a, you're, you're planning on doing buttons, this is where you make those changes and prep for that. And then you want to pin or baste your two pieces together. So I'm gonna cut out two of these, and then I'm gonna pin or baste those together to prepare for the next step, which is actually doing the fitting. So here's my finished sleeve. And you can see that I add way too much to the cuff because you know that, one, that way I have it so it can go down to my knuckles. If I have something that I want to be a long garment, um, all of my, pedal uh, coat hardy dresses. Um, I do that so it has that really long hand and then I can flip that back or fold it in different ways. And I, I that's, it's a very elegant uh, sleeve finish. So this one can be that long if I need it to be, but this measurement actually takes it to my wrist. So you can see that um, the angle changed a little bit because there was a little too much bulk in my elbow. So I took some of that out and this is how it all sat. Okay, so these are some of the garments I put these sleeves onto. This is Havek in his gambeson, uh, which is a layer of wool. And I don't remember if we lined that one in linen or if we just had it be a single layer of wool, but it has excellent range of motion and a gambeson is a perfect place for the sleeve to go.
Do you want to watch the video and then we can look at some of the... Yes, let's yeah. do that. So the video should answer most of the questions. Um, I'm going to ask that if you have questions, you're welcome to send them out uh, immediately. Um, but we'll try to just go through the video because it answers most of the questions in one go. And then we can uh, approach all of your questions afterwards. All right, so I am going to share the sound. And I'm not going to say anything because I echo when this happens. <laughs> and start the video. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Inter inter I have my Padawan. Um, Hi, I'm is, Sir is, is, We're going to talk today about sleeves and the mobility. All right, talk. Okay. okay, so my pattern so is still filming, and, and DG, my, my student, student is, is doing, doing the, the modeling. modeling. Oh, oh. There, you, there are. you are. So I want to make sure that we are all watching it. Here we go. In sleeves, in your garments, and in changing patterns so that you can have that full mobility. I want to give you a demonstration of what I like to call my standing jacket. Now this is a modern jacket, and in the three prime areas of fit, fashion, and function, you could say that as a modern jacket, this is pretty good fit. It doesn't pull on me. It doesn't cause, you know, it, it, it sits well as long as I am standing. And it has a little belt. So as a standing jacket, this does well. It has sleeves are a good length. When I stand, the waist is at my waistline. That's pretty good. Shoulders are to my shoulder points. So as a fashion jacket, this looks good until I start to move. And that is when the function starts to break down because, you know, just stretching my arms out, you can see that these sleeves aren't long enough. And it's not that the sleeve isn't long enough, it's that my arm moves inside the sleeve and there is not enough mobility here in the shoulder seam to allow me to do this. Now, it really gets obvious when I raise my arms up. You see the waist raises, the shoulder pad then collapses into my head. The underarm doesn't allow me to move. I can move, but my arm is sliding inside the sleeve versus having the sleeve move with my arm. And now we're way too short. So if I've moved, set up my pavilion, brushed my hair, drove my car, now my standing jacket is completely rumpled and it takes a little bit of maneuvering to get it back to looking suave and debonair. So what we're going to go over is in building a sleeve along with the jacket so that you can have that full range of motion so that if you're a fighter or building for a fighter, you can fight and not have suddenly your sleeves not function or worse, they prevent you from moving and you wind up yeah. acting like with no defense and with no offense because you can't get your arms there to make that happen. So here we go. So living in a world where we have a lot of stretch material, you know, this is a fairly tight t-shirt and it has long sleeves and the sleeves go nowhere and the body goes nowhere because the movement of my body is absorbed in the stretchiness of this fabric. So this might get tighter, but it doesn't actually restrict me at all. And as modern people, we get very used to having that full range of motion in our clothes. Sometimes with a fitted shirt or something that doesn't have the stretch, that movement comes because we move inside the sleeve or we move inside the pant leg. And so it doesn't necessarily adjust, but we move inside it and that allows us to have that motion. So it's important to look at how the body moves when you're doing a restrictive garment like a fighting coat that gives you the fit without giving you the restriction of motion because we need to be able to do all the things. You know, we need to be able to have our arms crossed. We need to be able to get into those weird positions and have our clothes not restrict our effectiveness on the field. This is my fighting coat and I do my fencing in this and the sleeves are made so that I have full range of motion. And you can see that the sleeves are at about my thumb when I extend my hand forward, they stay there. I can lift my arms all the way up, and the waist only shifts a little bit. 
I can literally lean all the way forward and I have plenty of room here in the shoulder. You will notice though that when my arms are back, there is a little bit of bulk right here. And that's because that all goes away when my arms go forward. That's a fashion choice, but that little bit of bulk gives me full range of motion. And I'm going to show you how to add that into your sleeve head when we do the, our uh, fittings. So one of the things to remember though is that the distance in here is and the stiffness of this fabric here will affect what this does here because this will pull. So even if there's no pull on the actual sleeve, there is this bulk that needs to collapse. And if it's fairly soft material, you won't even notice that. This is my student Dietrich, and he is going to be assisting us in uh, doing this fitting so I can show you uh, what I'm looking at when I'm, I'm making a garment. So I've done him up a drape of his body um, and complete with the arm eyes. We look at three different things. As I mentioned earlier, we're looking at the fit, we're looking at the fashion of it, and we're looking at the function of it. In the fashion of it, one of the things you want to look at is how far down the arm eye actually is on the garment you're looking at. Sometimes this shoulder comes out way here and this is where the sleeve drapes from. Sometimes um, it's way in. Um, and we're not going to be talking about grand assiettes, which is a whole different mechanic, but we're going to be talking about a regular set in sleeve that is following this line. The sleeve and its fit is composed of two parts. The first is the arm's eye, and the second is the sleeve head. Just like on your armor, where your helmet and your gorget interact together to keep you safe from here up. <clears throat> Just like in your armor, where your gorget and your helmet act to keep you safe from here up, the sleeve arm's eye and the sleeve head interact together. So if I take away more here, I need to add more here. And that affects how your sleeve head fits and how you work. So if you alter the arm's eye, you may need to alter the sleeve head. So before you start with the sleeve, make sure that the arm's eye is where you want it. In this case, I'm turn you this way, you can see that this arm's eye is a bit tight right here. And when he puts his arm forward, you can see, dun, 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 you can see how this bunches up and that creates stricture on him. Now, if this really was a fashion thing and we were married to having that stay that way, go you. But as far as being able to move freely in this and not hurt him um, in the long run, I'm going to want to alter this. One way I can alter this is I can take and add more here at the shoulder. So I can leave this where it is because this fits fine there but I could drop this down a little bit and that would give me more space in here and he would move inside that seam as opposed to having the seam move. He would move inside the seam. So what we're going to do is I'm going to actually cut away a certain amount of this. Sleeves actually fit better having them snugger under the arm. The more you drop this down, the more, like my coat, my standing coat, you wind up having to uh, have that entire thing adjust up and down with you, that moves the waistline. By having this in here, this, this fits in fairly well. So instead of, let me turn you, instead of having this come lower, because this is not interfering with him, this right here is interfering with him, and so I actually want to pull this out this direction. Do you love this t-shirt? Not particularly. Okay, great. So if I am bringing this down, I don't want to get this too far out, especially when I start. But if I bring this in here, that is actually going to give him that space that he needs by cutting this out. Remember that you still have seam allowance. So if I'm doing a half inch seam allowance around this, that means that this is going to be half an inch lower when I'm finished, but it will have the bulk of the seam allowance. The more bulky my coat is, the more bulky my sleeve material is, the more room I want to give him. Another thing to bear in mind is if this is an undershirt, it can be close to his skin. 
But if I am making this as an overcoat, all of this gets bigger because it's going over another layer of fabric. If you have, if you're making an overcoat and you know what it's going to go over, it helps to actually do that fitting first because then you have the doublet underneath this and you can do the fitting over that doublet. You know how much bigger this needs to be. If you don't have that luxury, you do know though that this needs to be much more free flowing if it's just on his body. Okay. So this side, what I have prepared earlier, has been cut away in that similar fashion. You can see that it's come up into here to give him that extra, uh, extra freedom of motion. I am looking at a couple of different spots on joints. This is the peak of his shoulder here, which is a fashion point because sometimes a garment will come to that or it'll come inside that joint or it'll actually sit out here. Um, where the uh, collarbones come together is what we call the point of the shoulder. And so when we talk about does it rest on the point of the shoulder, that's that bone that you can feel right here. Right, several bones you can feel right there. So in this case, I want this to sit right on that point of the shoulder. I could drop it if I wanted to, but I like this. Um, I want this to sit inside here so that when he moves, he is not having to rely on this fabric to move with him uh, to give him that freedom of motion. So I've taken this, the seam allowance will wind up sitting about here. So that will pull this back just that much further and it takes away from this hinge. I can also, as far as hinges go, I can also go inside of here. This spot, if you notice, comes in deeper here because of this tendon. When he reaches forward, turn you this way so they can see that, this tendon pushes right there. And that tendon often will cause you to have more restriction. So on me, you can see that tendon right there and that is going to push into my garment. And so I need to give that space, that tendon, more space in my arm's eye so that it doesn't restrict me. Even with my t-shirt, which is flexible, you can see that it pushes it out when I push on that tendon. Okay? All right. So I'm using um, a 16th century curved sleeve as my base. This Technique works with a straight sleeve, works with a single seamed sleeve. This is a two-part sleeve that has a crook in it. Um, I really like this pattern um, because it allows, first of all, I can document it, which is bonus, um, and it allows me to fit this sleeve and have less room in the, uh, in the crook of the elbow because this has the outer part of the elbow the inner part of the elbow has already been cut away, so I'm not dealing with a straight sleeve that bunches all of this up and then relies on the elbow here to stretch when you bend your arm. You want the straight of grain to go down the shoulder, right here, because on your arm, this part moves, this part moves, but this distance right here will stay the same. The joint flexes it and makes it go up and down, and same thing here, but this is going to be a uh, static measurement. So that's why I want my straight grain here. It makes the sleeve sit well. If you're doing it for a fashion reason that you need to put it off grain because you're doing uh, a bias so that you can have your stripes on an angle, be aware that that's gonna change how that fits and flows. And the tighter that sleeve is, the more wrinkles you're gonna wind up getting because of that. And fabric wrinkles, you know, having it be nice and smooth um, is all well and good, but it is it smooth when he's moving or is it only smooth when it's a standing coat? Things to think about. I start with, you see the curve here. This is my center of my shoulder, but the other side is exactly the same to start with. Now this may alter as we go along because um, it's going to probably take out some of the room that's right underneath here, but this winds up self-gusseting this sleeve. The deeper this is on the underside and the higher the peak is on the top of the shoulder, the less he can actually lift his arm up. Some things have a gusset in them, like your undershirt would have a gusset and that gives you that extra motion. 
This is self-gusseted, meaning that the gusset is a part of it as we go along. So when we put the sleeve on, I've adjusted my arm's eye where I want it to be, and I'm going to put this two-piece sleeve on. I want this center and my grain line to go to the peak of the shoulder. Now, can you rotate him? This way? Yeah. Yeah. So if if the my shoulder seam, if I'm doing a certain 16th century or even 17th century coats, that seam line may be back here, but I still need the grain line on the sleeve to come up to the peak of the shoulder and to the shoulder point. So I adjust that accordingly, and I'm going to put this fastener in first. So I'm going to pin the shoulder here. because this is my stationary one. This tells me how big this elbow is. And one of the difficulties that sometimes occurs is that you start messing with the length in here and then you start getting a lot of bulk up in here and so you, then you pin that up and out and you've just taken away any give that your sleeve has been designed to have. So pin this first and then you can mess with the rest of this. I've sewn this front seam because usually I find that I don't need to make many adjustments to it. So I want this to come in at either, fashion-wise, you make the decision, do you have it come in right under that tendon or right over that tendon? Ideally, you don't want it on that tendon because now all those straight stitches make that so it's not flexible. But if I put it slightly above that or below it, then I'm moving, that tendon is actually pushing into the fabric, not into that seam line. So I make that choice, and I'm going to put this one here. Now, instead of, if I decide that it needs to be um, higher or lower, so when we do this, his tendon is actually here with this, and I can feel him move. So I know that this is slightly above. So when I put that in as my um, second measurement, second point of contact, I pin that one in, and then I don't want to, because I want this to stay straight, if I have extra bulk in here, if this is going to be a I'm going to sleeve, pin this into place smoothly, and I'm going to have him rotate back, because that, that flying motion often will get rips in here, because for everyday use, very rarely are we completely extended backwards. As fighters, that happens, and you need to make accountability for that. Even in our everyday garb, uh, sometimes we find that not being able to make that motion means that we wind up with a rip right there. We don't do it on purpose, honest. Okay, so instead of adjusting this to make that smooth and straight, what I'm going to just do is that this now, knowing that this is my point, that I want this to come in at. Instead, this seam, that's why I have that, this seam will be adjusted instead. So this whole seam is going to get rotated up just that little bit. So I make note of that. But that's where that's going to come in at. And this whole thing would be adjusted to make that happen. All right, so I have allowed for this stretch, and he has room there for that to happen. There's a little bit, but not bad, not bad, I'm okay with that. Um, the next thing I want to do is I want to have him reach his hand above his head. Don't hit the lamp, there you go. And I'm going to have him just bend his elbow and rest this on his head, because he's going to need to be able to make that full range of motion. You come with your own pockets. So you can see that this self-gusset really fits in here well. Now sometimes when you do this and he reaches all the way up, you find that you've got a lot of extra here or um, that it might need a little bit of extra added. But in general, if the top and the bottom have looked the same when you cut them out, you should have enough to start self-gusseting. Here you can see that this is a little long, so I'm going to just push this down to the seam allowance. 
so that now they're even at the seam allowance, letting me know that this is going to get cut away. But this is the right length here. So you can see there that that was perfect. You can see here that that's perfect. That gives him enough. And I have his elbow is, is doing fine in, up in there. Okay. And having decided that those are going to alter, I'm going to have him now reach and hug himself. And reach out all the way across himself. Now, with this, I would want to make sure that his elbow hasn't gathered too much of the fabric. So, um, have him go down for a second, make sure this is good. Um, he's got enough room in here. Sometimes, especially if you have big biceps, um, this might need a little extra material in here. And that material is not being added in the arm's eye, but being added here in the sleeve. I'm going to add a couple more pins to this seam because uh, it's blousing a bit and giving me a false movement. If your forearm is too tight, then you need more motion up here. So if you have van braces or a, a snug uh, forearm, not necessarily armor van braces, but the van brace of the, the shirt or the blouse, if this isn't moving, you're going to need more bulk and more uh, stretch in the sh elbow and in the shoulder because that motion has to come from someplace. So if you're doing this as a very tight piece for fashion reasons, then you're going to need to have more in here to allow him to move. And we're doing this as a snug wrist that would probably have an opening here with buttons because this does not go over his hand. If I wanted it to go over his hand, I would need to add more in there so that that would, would go over his hand easily. Um, I am planning on this garment that this would have a vent here that would button shut so that then I can have this snugger when it is closed and not have extra bulk in there. Okay, so elbow's good. He bends his elbow. Not too tight? No. Nope. Forearm's not too tight? No. Nope. Okay. If I'm making like a German sleeve that I'm planning on doing decoration on this afterwards, I actually want this much looser in the beginning of the base than I do later on because each time I add a decorative element to this, it constricts it just a little bit. And if you made this snug to start with, by the time he's done being constricted, this thing's going nowhere and it's not going to be a, have the motion that you had originally. All right, so he reaches all the way forward and turn, 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 good. And you can see that there's just a little bit here that I'm like, hmm, okay, that would be better if I add a little bit of fabric right in here. Um, I have extra bulk in here because I did this so that we'd have enough for the arm. So this can come in. I'm going to pin this. And this is going to, I, I like to have this one come right into this seam because I like seams to match and it makes me happy. But fit wise and uh, function wise, you can actually have that go, it can actually be a lower seam here if you need it to be. Uh, but this comes right along this stretch of the arm, so I'm okay with that being there. Now because of the way we did our sleeve, this is actually slightly on the bias because the straight grain is over here. And as that curved out, then this became a, a bias, so that allows this to have a little bit more stretch when he's moving. Just because you pin these even doesn't necessarily mean they need to be even. So this can come here and still give me this extra bulk that I need here. Now this needs a slightly a, another piece right added in there so that I don't wind up too I'm constrained. Forward. Okay, so I have an extra piece, just a scrap bit, and I'm going to put that in there. And I'm, I'm not laying it in as um, seam allowance on that side. What I'm doing is I'm making it so that this will come and be along this seam allowance. So this can be pinned in as if it is attached to the arm's eye. Okay. 
And because when I recut this, this piece will actually be a part of that, I'm just going to go ahead and put this and pin it in as if it's a part of it. I could also use tape and just tape that in as a part. Um, but that allows me to know how much extra to add in when I'm done. I recommend always adding the piece actually into your pattern and then doing a refit rather than just putting a little arrow that says, hey, I need to add an inch, because you will probably forget. I will forget. So I actually like to change the pattern so that it matches what I want it to do. And obviously, this is not something you can fit yourself. But hopefully, you can show the person doing fittings, this is what you want, and away you go. Okay, so now he has enough room here. And if you... When you saw the sleeve head, it actually came up to the back. I didn't have it to do like a regular sleeve head and, and dip back down because I know I want this extra motion. All right, and I'm going to have you turn to the front and drop your arm. Okay, and we know that we have a little extra bulk in here. So we're going to take some of that out. I have failed on pins. And just a random aside that you know has no bearing on sleeves, but when you are doing your buttons, you want a button across your nipple line, and most big busted women can tell you this as a fact, is that if you don't have a button here, or at least on either side of that point, you are going to gap right here. So for your fit purposes, um, mark the nipple line so you know where this needs to be. Okay, so I've taken out some here. I've added a little in the back. I check and make sure my drape is doing well. Okay, he's going to probably not need this extra bit here when we move this. So that's going to come in. And then you make that decision on do I take it out both sides, do I take it out evenly, or do I take it out a little bit more on top? But I want to make sure that this part is going to sit well and not wind up too strained. So I look at that. I'm like, okay, good. So we're going to take out a little bit here. It doesn't seem to be a part of the motion. And then, very gently, I'm going to have him rotate his arm. Let me have you move forward again because I want to put an extra pin in this so that it doesn't give you a false... Um, you don't need that one. Okay, so what I did is I just added an extra pin into here to make sure that he's not giving me a false motion because that's gapping while he moves. All right, and very carefully, I'm going to have him rotate his arm and not take out the light. So he's going to go up. Okay, now I've taken out all the structure pins out the front, so I'm going to hang on to this and have to do it again. A little bit of pull there, not bad though. Let's have that not jab you. Okay, and you put your both arms forward. How's that? Good, well. That's good. Put your arms, do your wings. Pretty good? Yep. Okay, so... Um, I have a good mock-up here. I've taken out some material here. I've added a little bit of material here in the back. And I've taken out some underneath. So I can go through and I can mark all of these so that I know in the future... Oh wait, there's one in the pocket. Ta-da! So I know that this is being added in. And this pin is bogus. It worked fine before. What happened? He got mad at you. It got mad at me. All right. So I know that this is my seam. This is coming out here. Da, 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 da. Mark that seam allowance. 
Okay, I didn't have to adjust anything there. They're good. The elbow's good. Um, have it come all the way up. I'm going to mark here because my seam, this is actually my cutting line, not my seam allowance, but I know that. Okay, any other notes you need to yourself, add that. Now I'm going to go and recut the sleeve and sew that together and see if once we sew it together, if that gives us a good fit. Don't stop here because you have a bunch of adjustments that you've made. Go ahead and drop your arm. And you want to make sure that in each of those adjustments, because pins lie, that you haven't given yourself a false dynamic in the motions. So I'm going to put this together and we'll see what we got. Now that the sleeves are complete, you can see how they've changed. The underneath one is my original draft, and my upper one is my sleeve that we've come up with. You can see that after the fitting, here on the under sleeve, it's become quite a bit narrower. And I've had to add that extra little bit to come up into the arm's eye in the back so that we have that extra movement. On the upper sleeve, it's also narrowed a little bit here and has raised into the back of his arm's eye. If you have somebody that doesn't have quite as much motion or need quite as much motion, that doesn't have to come up as high. But you can see that even in our final draft, even though this has changed and arced down a little bit as per our original, we could get rid of this extra material you can see that uh, the shape still remains fairly high, allowing for that self-gusseting. When I do these measurements, it's done on a moving body because I am building for mobility. Trying to do this with just measurements, I have found, is fairly inadequate, although it is possible. Alright, so I've altered my sleeve, I've added in all the changes that I thought were relevant. I go ahead and I'm pinning this in. Again, I start at the top of the shoulder. I make sure that the elbow sits where I want it to sit. If I want this to be a, a tighter van brace, this is the point that you know I, I would have made this tighter and marked where my elbow point is. This is fairly loose, so um, it has a gentle curve. It's fine. I have him go ahead and hug himself. I'm like, oh, well, see, that's not extra anyway, because you know when you look at it just hanging there, you think that's a lot of extra fabric. So, so when his, his arm is down, you can see that there's, there's quite a bit of extra fabric here. But when he reaches forward, all of that disappears. When you first make a garment, this is pretty stiff, especially if you have interlinings and other stuff. And you may think, wow, that, that really sticks out a lot. But give it a little bit of time to break in, and often that completely goes away. little slack there, there, it's good. If when you're making your final sleeve and your coat in, um, if you find that you have a little bit of extra in your sleeve, you can adjust this seam again and just bring that in a little snugger and that way it all fits in. Okay, so you see how that lays in there nice and smooth. Arm on top of your head, please. There you go. I'm going to have you turn a little bit this way. Having a little extra material in the underarm isn't a bad idea. If you know, you're doing this and you're like, oh, I could have taken out some more, well, you can try. If, you, if the bulk of it is causing you issue, then definitely. I try not to add too much in fencing garments because this needs to have an extra layer of puncture proof, which makes this whole underarm structure much uh, less flexible. 
And so I try to take out as much of this extra bulk as possible um, and still allow full range of motion. All right, and put your arm down and turn towards me. And you give me just a little bit of lift so I can get under here. Yeah, always in the way. <laughs> All right, and I have a little bit of extra in here that, that I didn't take out before that I'm going to go ahead and take out. I had adjusted that seam so that, that it wasn't, it had less taken out on the bottom than on the top, but apparently um, I can take that out a little bit more if you go ahead and wing back. Okay, yeah, see, I have a little bit of extra bulk right here. That will come out and should be fine. So that'll, that'll come out there. And I want to actually put this pin away from his armpit so that when it stabs him, it's not because of me. Same thing with this one. We're going to do that because this is a, a tight point that when he starts moving his arm around, um, I don't want that to stab him. Now, if you have, that said, if you have a subject that you're, you know, particularly peeved at, you do you, babe. Since I stole these out of his coat, I want to make sure that his arm motion is not being reflected in the movement of the coat. So I'm going to pin it back shut. If you change your arm's eye for any reason, if, if you feel that this needs to be altered, um, you're going to need to look at your sleeve cap again. All right, so give me some motion. Don't take out the lights. Pretty good. Let me hang on to here, see what happens. Not bad. All right, so you can see that motion. You can see that when he flexes his arm all the way forward, we have, we have a pin that's trying to abandon ship. Um, but he has full range of motion here. There's actually even a little bit of slack, which is not a bad thing. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how to do the sleeves. And this can work with any set of sleeves. It can by doing the motions and adding the extra material in and having the extra bit of self gusseting makes a big difference. But you can see that this is just the same two piece sleeves. I've just altered the heads. Thank you very much for watching. Stay safe. So well. Okay. So I'm, oh, I'm sorry, sorry for, for the, the jumping. That was, that was annoying, but um, hopefully it was enough that when I, Said, you know this and that and this you were actually able to tell what I was talking about yeah I, I apologize for the choppy video I'll have to figure that out for the ongoing series but um like we said Mari will be putting that on sewing with Sir Mari on YouTube and if she says yes I will link to it um, in the comments on the YouTube of this episode excellent yes let's do that we will we'll add that in and I'll also do a uh, a thing with the the green sleeves so that you can see how they go together so that that way that's all taken care of so someone asked before we started watching the video um when you start with the sleeves do you start with the top and the bottom matching each other are they identical they're identical when i start um and i i let the the fitting part of it actually handle the rest of it so um and i wind up with because I have different sized humans in my life, I wind up with uh, some base sets that I can start with. So this sleeve, um, you can see that it, it's been altered. So there's the bottom and there's the top. And that's how it's been altered for this person. Make sure you label them with the person's name. And when you get, when you're done with your mock-up one and the one that you've altered, throw it away because what happens is you wind up with these extras sitting around and you're like, oh, this is the one I wanna use. You cut it out of your fashion fabric and then realize that you didn't add the two inches to that pattern, you added it to the other pattern. And um, especially at midnight, that makes difficulties. Not saying I've ever been there. So at the end of that video, when you are showing like you're gonna take some of the bulk out and you, um you pin it, how do you 
remind yourself that you're taking like what that pen means you know like um, you didn't draw on it there <laughs> yes i probably should have drawn on it because you know th there are things that i know that i i've done um and if i'm going immediately to alter that then i remember uh, but having multiple colored pens also helps so as you saw i started in pink and then i went to the blue because there's different <laughs> things Hi, you, haven't got, you haven't got groceries he says hi and he brought me coffee because he loves and he bought wonder woman 1984 so i am well loved hi misty hi <laughs> Um, Hello, audience. Audience and everybody else. I don't care about anybody else. But yeah, so yeah, so when I'm when I'm looking at this and making that decision on how much of the bulk to take out of this, uh, that that very much is a fashion versus motion decision. So if I'm like, oh, okay, well, I have a lot of bulk underneath, and that can actually come up, then the under sleeve is actually. I'm taking out more material than I am out of the top sleeve. Because as I said in the video, you don't want to necessarily, they don't have to stay even. I'm I'm creating this literally from whole cloth. So if I like the look of that tighter on the bottom, then it's better. One of the things I brought up in the video and I touched on briefly was like if you're making German sleeves um, to have, if you're adding extra bits, um, that you want to make sure that you give yourself enough room in it. Because like for this instance, I added this lovely decoration. Now this sleeve is the same model as my other sleeve. It has full range of motion the whole bit. But as soon as I sew this line of stitching around, it acts as stay stitching. This line will no longer stretch. So if I add a bunch of decoration, this sleeve slowly gets Whereas it doesn't necessarily get smaller, it now has less flexibility in each piece of the material. And that creates difficulty because then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow for the motion that my draped fabric, my single layer of cotton, let me have a lot of motion. This isn't going to do that anymore because it's heavier material. So bear that in mind when you're planning on adding extra decoration. You may need to make the sleeve a little bigger before you add the extra decoration. That, that's good to know. Um, uh, and, I, and I really did, I loved the different color pens because it looks like one was like, this is where the seam allowance is and the other ones, this is where I'm gonna cut and then another one's yeah. gonna add there. Um, yeah, and it, when the more information you give yourself, the better you're gonna be. So for instance, um, one of the difficulties that I have run into in the past, somebody in my shop once, um, if you mark the seam allowance on some things and you mark your cutting line on other things, and then you don't remember which one is which, then you can have difficulties. Because if I'm marking the pin line, that's where the stitches go. And I know I need to have seam allowance beyond that. And if you have, for some reason, you want to have a lot of seam allowance, let's say you're working with a different seam treatment, and so you want to have extra seam allowance, you need to indicate that to yourself because otherwise, later when you go pick this pattern up, you're not going to remember all those things. Well, you might, but I won't. So I, won't. I make sure that I, I put that in. And my patterns have gotten more and more wordy as I've gone along through life because there are things that it's like, this is the green doublet I made, and this is the orange doublet I made. And that way I can remember why I changed things. Yeah, I think I'd probably make myself a legend and be like, green is this, pink is this, orange is that. Um, <laughs> leave it with the with the thing. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, you leave and you go eat something and you come back and you can't remember. That's exactly right. I walked out of the room. Now I don't know who I am. So your sister asks, um, if you use a zigzag, um, to add the decoration on like a German, can you keep the stretch? Uh, it will keep some of the stretch to it. Um, I would still allow for it to not be, I, I would still make it slightly bigger because even though you're you're doing the zigzag, uh, zigzag's not always appropriate for what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, the zigzag will allow for stretch to still occur. Will, will it give you a clean line? Uh, if, Maybe. Okay. Maybe is the answer there. I don't think it will be as clean a line because now you, you're basically creating gaps. This is why it will work. 
Um, but if it's a, a wool going on the top of it, the wool will fill in the gap for you. But if you're doing a silk, it'll be obvious in that it'll have little poles. Well, um, do you want to look at the, the pictures of the, all the different kinds of outfits that can use this kind of sleeve? Sure, let's do that. Right. So these are garments that I have made um, and have been in use forever. And because I wear a family full of lotion, Come on to that. There we go. Can that wait? <laughs> Come on, Yevon, we're live here. <laughs> <laughs> Forever and ever, you will know that my love has put away groceries for me. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so as, as we said, this is Havek and his gambit. Can, can we not we share not audio? audio? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn that off. There we go. There we go. Fix it. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and a gambeson obviously you need to fight. Well, here is myself and my squire and my apprentice, and we're all in our very pretty dresses, but you know, we're all still functional people um, and we all need to be able to do stuff. So even in these lovely gowns, we have full range of motion. We are still able to throw that shot because you know, if I can't throw that shot, you're limiting how I can talk. So yeah, how do you, how do that you allows you, all of that to work. How do you tell the fighting story if you can't throw the shot? That's right. That's right. And even in these Italians, now these Italians are made with that same sleeve base. And obviously these are, you know, 16th century. So it's a very appropriate sleeve for these. And then we did all the decoration on top of them, but they needed to have a fairly close sleeve. So we made up for that uh, when we did the, the modeling. I excuse his epithets. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently live, live TV doesn't uh, compute for him. Um, so they have all of the decoration on there is stitched down, but we knew by then that if you start adding a bunch of stitching, it's going to alter how the sleeve flows. So we allowed for that, but they have full range of motion because of what we knew. Excellent. And I had just have to say, um, this picture of Helga floors me. I, I had to look at it like four times. I'm like, no way, <laughs> no way. Everybody's like, who is that? Okay, so here's the back of, of a finished coat hardy. And this is uh, Mikolaj when he was king. And you can see that the little bit of folds on, that are in the back of that sleeve. And as he reaches forward, he can put her crown on. He can do all the things he needs to do because there's no restriction to it. Very cool. <laughs> and here's Mikolaj being silly. Um, and both his, the undercoat and the overcoat, even though the overcoat has short sleeves and you can move inside that sleeve more, he still has good motion in that arm's eye. With a short sleeve, because you are now not dealing with restriction around the elbow or the forearm, uh, you can actually make that a little bit tighter in the bicep. But if it's going over something else, you have to allow for the garment it's going over. How much um, do you have to accommodate for like um, a fabric? Like your your real fabric is going to be sort of heavy and non-stretchy and the mock-up you used is a cotton that stretches better. How much um, accommodation do you make for that? Uh, de depending on the fabric, um, if it is something that doesn't have a lot of stretch, like for all of my fencing garb, we're lining that in denim because denim is going to make it puncture proof. So uh, the denim I have, fashion denim does not do that just in case you're a fencer listening to this and think you found a way out. It has to be like Wrangler denim, not like fashion denim. Um, but that denim is very stiff. And so often because denim... I got a whole roll of it fairly cheap. Often I'll make my patterns out of the denim. And then I can, when I do the mock-up, I know how much motion it's going to have. So that is something to take into consideration, um, especially if you're adding multiple layers to something because your lining might be stiffer than you thought. Often lining is fairly flexible, but if you have an interlining that is going to stiffen that fabric and not let it move, that's important to know. So this is Master Gregory um, in his, the mod uh, outfit that I made for him. And this is off of Matt Nagy's patterns. And if you have not read Matthew Nagy's book, I really recommend that, that 
be something that you purchase. He has two volumes currently. He has pandemic has allowed him to make a whole lot of YouTube videos and he is fantastic for watching. And even if you decide you don't want to use his methods, knowing that they are there is extraordinarily educational. And he has leaped and bound us. How does he spell his last name and what is his YouTube channel? G-N-A-G-Y. Um, so it starts with a G. That, that can throw people off. That would have thrown me. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and I don't know what a YouTube channel is. Okay, well, I, I can do the, the YouTube search. But cool. I am sure that we have a guest that has it on their fingertips and will send that to us shortly. Probably. All right, next. So this is Padawan and she is in her Nagi outfit. And so uh, this doublet was made using that same pattern. Um, and so she has full range of motion in there. She swears that after putting on all the braid that she will never fence in it. However, she could, she's not incapable of fencing in it. She just doesn't want it stabbed. Oh, and there it's it. It's me. <laughs> I'll stop sharing. Yep. So a variety of garments. Um, and like I said at the beginning, mostly anything that's not a raglan type sleeve, a tea tunic or uh, something like that gets these sleeves. If they're going to have tight sleeves, then this is where I go with it. Even if I don't put the seam down the front, even if that's a closed seam or a, a fold, um, that back seam, I still do that, those motions. So the all of the different, all of the motion of your shoulder is coming into the head of that sleeve. Very cool. Um, I think we went through everyone's questions, but um, I want to give people an opportunity since you have the goddess of sewing herself right here uh, <laughs> to ask the questions. So um, ask the questions if you have them. Um, <laughs> So when I started looking at sleeves and, and doing a class versus just me doing sleeves, because it's one thing for me to do a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I have your body here so I can make things work. But when I started to look at class stuff, I thought, okay, how, how do historically have sleeves been made so people have motion? And so I went back to some of the 1930s and 1940s uh, tailoring books that I had because I was like, okay, obviously people have to move and they didn't have all the stretch material. So what did they do? And starting to look at that, you know, they talk about, and this sleeve head will give you 180 degrees of motion, not 360, but they figured if you could get your arm straight, that was a lot of motion. And I thought, well, that's not useful. Uh, but I think that in a lot of the patterns that we look at throughout time, if you look at Victorian patterns, for instance, there, the back is very narrow because the posture was such that you stood very narrow and the sleeves didn't allow you to have a lot of motion because we peasants move, the wealthy don't have to move. And so we are taking that fashion and making a choice of, okay, I'm going to have a little extra bulk in the back of that arm's eye because I want to be able to have the full motion, even though uh, they don't have it in the actual garment. Uh, the Civil War jackets are very interesting to look at, though, because you had people that had to get their arms up to shoot, and we have patterns from the Civil War. So you can look at the arm size from those, and they're similar in a lot of ways to the 16th century jackets. So it, it's fascinating to look at stuff. And another way to learn tailoring and to get some ideas is to go to the thrift store and pick up a, a jacket, you know, a cheap jacket, and take it apart and look at all the layers and look at all the different stitching things that they've done and then look at the pattern overall. Now, obviously if it's been worn, there'll be some stretching in it, but it's extraordinarily educational uh, to, to take something apart and learn from it that way. So someone wants to know if you use the same technique for tie-on sleeves. For a tie-on sleeve, you don't need this extra bolt underneath because your tie-on sleeve is open. So in that, I will often cut away so that it sits and looks much more like that modern sleeve head that we were looking at earlier, because I don't need to have it gusseted. I have air to gusset it. I was going to ask if I was going to have someone over and I was going to do this whole measuring process, what, what would I sell them? I need two hours of their time, three hours? 
Well, are you drinking? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay. Well, if you're not drinking, it goes faster. Um, I usually, I can, if I have a body that's already built and draped, then usually it takes less than an hour. Um, I try to give it the extra time to make sure that we, you need time to do an original draft to put on the sleeve, to make your alterations, to make another draft and put that one on. If I know that person's gonna be showing up for later fittings, um, I am less meticulous because I know that that can be, uh, when I actually get the fashion garment together, then I can put those, the fashion sleeves on them and make sure, and often I won't even drape the sleeves until after we've done the body and I've sewn the body together, the actual fashion body. So that that way I'm not dealing, I'm dealing with all the stiffness the material has inherently. And then I know that these sleeves are gonna work with it. And by then I've worked with the material. So I have an idea of how stiff it is. And if I need to make these sleeves have allowances for that. Um, if it is if somebody like I, I made a Waffenrock for my good friend, Duke Arthur. And I knew that I wasn't gonna to get to fit him. And I haven't seen him since, thank you pandemic. Um, but to make that garment, I made a million notes that normally I would just keep in my head, knowing that I wasn't going to sew it right away, knowing that I couldn't do any further fittings with him until it was a finished garment. And that makes me very nervous. You know, my, my beloved apprentice, Breck, uh, Mistress Breck, uh, is amazing and can take measurements and make a garment. And I, I'm fascinated by her all the time. I go into heart palpitations when I have to do that. Uh, because I sew for motion and to allow for all the vagrancies of how bodies move, it's much easier if you're standing in my living room doing it. But uh, so that's, those are things that I, I take into consideration. Excellent. Um, well, I don't see any other questions. Um, do you have anything you want to add? I think we have covered all the things. I, again, I'm, I'm sorry the video was jumpy. Um, we will get that up to YouTube. Um, I saw a couple other places that I might edit it. I thought I had edited the cough out, but apparently it kept coming back. <laughs> Video editing is not in my skill set, and, and I kind of used a, a free version to make it at least work. We're um, all volunteers here. We're all volunteers here. Even even my video software is is volunteer. Volunteer too. <laughs> That's right. Not volunteers. Well, I really appreciate this because it helps so much to have someone walk you through it. And so people know um, you have Sewing with Sir Mari. That's a page on Facebook as well as a YouTube channel. And it, you're also Mari Joy or Mari Alexander? Mari Alexander. Mari Alexander on Facebook. On Facebook. See, I just, I just look up Mari and I, I don't even pay attention to the last name, but um. <laughs> So, and, and Mari is very approachable. So if you have questions, I am throwing her out there. She'll, she'll, uh, she'll get back to you. So. Right. And I'll, I'll probably direct you back to videos because that works out well. Uh, so absolutely. And what is your next, um, with your leveling up video going to be? Leveling up um, for my non-Australian co-hosts. It's going to be on Sunday nights um, at 6 p.m. Pacific. And the next one is not this Sunday, but next Sunday. And it will be my lovely husband and I making a sword. So sort of a different thing, but still fighting related. And um, he makes the best swords and we'll use a little tool dip on the thrusting tip and it'll be very cool. So Excellent. thank you all for joining us for the premiere episode. Thank you so much, Mari, for making the premiere episode so good. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.